Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Yingbo uh, mentioned uh, symbolic arrays, and now we're going to get to hear all about them, courtesy of uh, Shashi Gauda, um, who is one of the creators of Symbolics.jl and also has made lots of contributions to SciML libraries like Modeling Toolkit. So please take it away, Shashi. OK, thank you. Uh, so my name is Shashi Gauda. I am a grad student at the Julia Lab at MIT. Um, previously, I worked at Julia Computing, building Julia DB. Um, if you know about it, um, yeah, currently I'm working on Symbolics.jl. Um, and this talk is going to be about uh, symbolic arrays. And uh, for, uh, to begin with, I will define what symbolic arrays are, what I mean by them. And we will look at like uh, what other computer algebra systems have symbolic arrays and what kind of features they have. And uh, we will also look at symbolics the new implementation uh, of symbolic arrays and symbolics. Um, and we'll also look at uh, what's like the future direction of array languages in general is going to be, um, or is right now. Um, yeah, so let's get started. Um, so what do I, yeah. Um, so by symbolic arrays, what I mean is, uh, um, yeah, so being able to represent uh, operations on symbols that represent arrays um, and having expressions on those symbols, right? So what I mean by that is uh, it, it, no matter what the size of the arrays uh, is, um, you, you, you should be able to represent them in O of 1 space, which is constant space. Um, this is uh, obviously different from an array of symbols, which we can do in Julia just using the generic array type. And most computer algebra systems have symbolic arrays. Um, and it uh, turns out Maple, SymPy, and SymEngine do not support symbolic arrays in the sense that I described, but they do have an array of symbols um, in the sense that they have their own matrix type uh, where you can put symbols in, and they also support mate. The same matrix type is used for uh, numbers as well. Um, yeah, uh, Mathematica has symbolic arrays. You can say that a symbol um, belongs to an array um, class, and uh, all the algebra on that symbol will, will be based on that. Um, Maxima has this, but Maxima is actually GPO which makes it not usable for a lot of the applications that people in the Julia community use, use Julia for. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, finally, Symbolics has array symbols um, as of um, six months ago or something. OK. Um, yeah, so I just want to do like a quick overview of uh, features. So if you guys have questions, I have a um, I have a Julia ripple here, and uh, I can I can um, try out things for you or um, show you things on that. But uh, to begin with, we can create symbol uh, array symbols using this notation um, at variables. Um, so it's just an it, 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 this this means that x is a matrix with a uh, of size ten by uh, ten by five. So X is a symbol which is a subtype of abstract array in this case. And any operation on these symbolic arrays result in symbolic expressions without being expanded out into their full form. Um, so here we have a matrix vector multiply. Here we have like a simple broadcast with uh, three inputs. And you can see that it um, represents like the high level expression tree of what needs to be done on the arrays. And uh, for what Symbolics is really good at is being able to allow you to uh, write rewrite rules in terms of uh, uh, this DSL here. Um, so, um, so here are three rules for transforming array expressions. The first one it says that an adjoint of an adjoint of an array is the array itself. And the second one says, uh, if you have A times B times C, where A times B is performed first, then convert it into A times B times C, where 
B times C is performed first. If the intermediate result of forming A times B uh, is more expensive in terms of size than uh, forming B times C. Um, so this is basically, this is the rule that you require uh, to um, simplify a matrix chain multiplication, right? So if you have a bunch of uh, matrix, ma matrix multiplies on a vector or a bunch of matrix multiplies themselves, then you can apply this rule to kind of minimize the intermediate storage required. And then the next rule here um, basically fuses two bro broadcast operations. Um, so you can write rules like this and immediately apply it on um, the symbolic expressions that you just created. Um, and here's an example. Here I'm creating a rule uh, for the matrix chain multiply optimization. And then um, here the input is x times y times b, and x times y is 10 by 10, uh, but it's ultimately just two matrix vector multiplies. Um, so if you apply the rule here, you get back a new expression, uh, which, um, which shows that it's, uh, it's first doing the matrix vector multiply here, and then doing the matrix vector multiply on the resulting vector. So I will uh, talk about this, this notation of array op in the next slide. Um, um, yeah, so if you, if you uh, enable this, uh, flag, uh, this flag um, called show array op from symbolics, uh, every time you would perform an array operation, you get back uh, a notation. Let me check again. Um, uh, which, which says what is the loop going on inside, basically. So this is a variation on uh, what many people call the Einstein summation notation, uh, which basically means that uh, for every i, um, this is how you compute it, right? So it's saying that uh, for every i, take x i comma k and multiply it with y comma k. And since k does not appear on the left-hand side, this also means that uh, the dimension where k is used must be reduced over. And by default, we reduce over it with the plus operation. So this becomes a matrix vector multiply. Um, in the second example, we have uh, um, j in the left-hand side, but not i. Um, oh, yeah. This was supposed to be prod. So here I, uh, I, I want to use a different reduce function, uh, which is not plus, right? So um, that's also allowed. Yeah, you can have a star as the reduce operation. So in this case, it's doing a product over the first dimension. Um, and that's the array of you get. And yeah, finally, you can nest these things. So for example, this adjoint is written as uh, 1 comma i equals uh, y of y, y of i, uh, which basically turns a, uh, column, a column vector into a row vector. And then it's doing a couple of broadcasts. Um, uh, and broadcast is, in this case, it's just a, um, it's all, yeah, in, in this case, it's just um, um, doing two loops, right? Um, yeah, so. As you can see, it, it encodes both the high-level operation where, and uh, this loop formulation of the operations that we are doing. And it turns out we can represent um, most of Julia's um, standard array uh, library using uh, this notation. So for example, broadcast reduce over any dimension um, as some of the linear algebra up to blast uh, two or, uh, or like even blast three where except the solve operations can be represented in this way. Um, and it also ha has the feature to represent um, indexing. So slicing arrays can also be represented using this array of notation. Uh, so when you do a get index, this is what it internally represents. Uh, here I have a slice of X being up, uh, broadcasted with the sign function. So you can see the internal array op is basically, it's a identity uh, operation, but 
with the index set subset from the entire index set. Um, yeah. So why do we need this tensor notation? It seems like a extra level of complication, but uh, it turns out it makes a lot of things very easy. Uh, so first of all, it encodes the loops. This means we can generate the loops when we want to compile it down to Julia code. Um, secondly, um, it, it allows. OK, yeah, so I'll just continue from here. So I was uh, saying that uh, even get index can be represented using this notation, and we do it in symbolics. Um, so in this case, x there is a slice of x here, and the internal loop contains the uh, ranges of the indices. And this, this also makes it easy to uh, have shape propagation and checking going on at all times. Um, OK, so why do we need this tensor notation? It looks like uh, an extra layer of complication, but it turns out it makes a lot of things easier. First of all, we have the loops encoded in this notation, so we can generate the loops uh, in Julia when we need to compile a certain operation. Um, secondly, shape propagation just becomes centralized, so we don't have to do it for every single operation uh, that is there in the standard library, so we just do it for um, arrays in general. Uh, and yeah, differentiation uh, becomes possible. We just have to differentiate the internal um, expressions. And finally, it also makes it possible for us to um, go back and compute a specific element of, a, um, of the result of an array operation, right? So here I have a x broadcast over x times y. And I'm indexing the first element. So if you do this in the REPL, you just get this uh, lazy uh, expression. And then if you call symbolics.scalarize, it's going to go back and um, take the tensor notation and start applying the indices that you want, starting from 1. Right? And then it's going to say that um, the result of the first element here is going to be uh, the dot product of y with the first row of x and x of that, right? So this becomes possible with the tensor notation. Um, but, uh, yeah, so and then we can compile these uh, expressions to Julia code uh, using this two expr. There are three ways to do it. So firstly, there is two expr, which will just give a code fragment. We're using the same names um, for how to do this. And then there's in place expr which uh, gives a, a for loop. And you also need to give like an output array symbol. And uh, basically, it, it gives some code which fills up the output array symbol with the operation required. So in this case, it's a, um, it's a matrix vector multiply. So it, it has one loop um, going over all the case and one loop going over all the uh, i's um, and filling up each element of the output. Um, so, and then finally, we have this build function, uh, which is what Marlin toolkit uses. So if you give it an array operation and then say x and y are the inputs, it just gives you back uh, um, a function which takes x and y as inputs, uh, a tuple x and y as inputs, and uh, does the operation required. Um, and in this case, it's using like the, just the high level representation, not the loops representation. Um, yeah, so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some languages which do, which are doing novel things in array specific, um, domain specific languages. Um, so first of all, there is like JAX, which uh, mirrors the NumPy API. Uh, so it, it is kind of symbolic in the sense that when you, um, when you create arrays in JAX and apply operations in them, it maintains this expression tree. And then it can do um, automatic differentiation on it. And it can do um, shape propagation and checking. And the internals work mostly as if we are doing you know, um, uh, symbolic tracing, right? as if you're running something with symbols. Right? Um, but it's also just geared towards uh, machine learning. It doesn't explicitly provide symbols. Um, and then there is DEX, 
which is a, a functional language. Um, it's kind of like Haskell, the flavor, or ML. And um, yeah, just checking again. And it, it, it allows you to express um, for loops or comprehensions. Um, and the uh, index sets are part of the type. So which means that like the index ranges are part of the type, basically. And every time some operation happens, the index sets become, um, yeah, index set, uh, sets are uh, type checked, in, in a sense. Um, but this language does not have uh, metaprogramming, which means uh, you can't take the expressions themselves and transform it in the language. Um, uh, so, but if you think about it, since symbolics um, can compile down to Julia code, it, 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 when you're doing symbolics, you are doing metaprogramming um, in some sense. And it's like the most um, user-friendly form of metaprogramming where there's the, you're manipulating these expressions with like a rich library of uh, things around it. Um, yeah, and there's halide, which is mostly geared towards parallelism. I think I'm running out of time. So um, uh, par parallelism of for loops and- Ashi, you yeah. can go um, for five more minutes. Oh, okay, thank you. Strict there, so. Yeah, cool, thanks. Um, so, yeah, again, halide is, uh, all the features have to be built into the language. Um, but uh, I think symbolic arrays let you, uh, allow you to have much more flexibility in that sense. Um, so in summaries, uh, array symbolics have been around for a while, but like their, the attitude towards it from other CAS, uh, other computer algeb algebra systems have been like, you know, this is just another type of symbol. Um, but in symbolics, we take it a step further and we have multiple encodings. And in the sense, we, we also maintain like the for loop representation of an ER array operation, which allows us to do compilation and optimizations. Um, um, and um, yeah, it, this is super important for the SIML ecosystem because that's like compiling symbolics is what we care about the most. Um, yeah, and it becomes a metaprogramming tool in the end. Um, yeah, so things we are working on in the future uh, includes uh, loop uh, uh, generating the code uh, to be very efficient uh, using loop vectorization and using crystal rod in general. Uh, the differentiation of array operations is coming and we're working on stencils. And uh, I have this project to do like XLA style optimization of flux models. So if anybody here is interested in doing that, then uh, please uh, talk to me uh, after the talk. Um, yeah, I wanted to acknowledge uh, Yingbo, Chris, and Alan uh, for helping me work on this. Uh, Yingbo has, uh, when I have questions, I always talk to Yingbo and it always clears me up, uh, clears them up. So uh, if you want to use Symbolics, I hope you can, uh, you know this already. You can go to juliasymbolics.org and read more about it. Thanks. All right. Uh, thank you, Shashi.